So in the time that I have, what I want to do is to build on what Richard has done. Looking back, what has changed? What do we need to do? How can we use our energy, our research, our voices to change for the next generation? So where do we start now? 2015, that end line. As Richard has said, more than we could have imagined. I think especially even the last five years, not even just the last 10 years. If you look at the average annual rate of change, uh, particularly where we have more robust data, you can see that it's picking up year by year. And that is something that has happened because of a more than doubling of donor data, commitments from national governments, uh, but also actual numbers. The things that we've tracked have moved more. So if you look at the maternal estimates, we used to only do them every 10 years. They weren't out there. Now we have them more frequently, hopefully every two to three years. And that increased data also reflects more real data coming in. So for the child, the number of mortality surveys have more than quadrupled in the last five years compared to what we were doing 10 years ago. Still uncertain, but the things that we really want to change, we measure. So maternal mortality, as Richard has said, halved. We still won't get the goal, but a halving is a fantastic step forward. But still almost 300,000 women who die and almost all preventable. That's still unacceptable, and it's particularly unacceptably heavy on Africa. So 60% of those deaths in Africa. What about children? After the first month of life, still 3.5 million dying. And that's very heavily driven by stunting that we have really failed to address and make progress for. Still pneumonia and diarrhea, an issue in this uh, era. But HIV, we have gone from a large burden down to about 100,000 deaths. Through focus, through huge investments, and also through data driving that change. As Richard has said, left behind the newborns. Now almost half of under five deaths, so children dying before their fifth birthday, are dying in that first month. Almost a million on the very first day, their birthday. And that has only come onto the agenda, not actually because governments now care about newborns, but because a target showed to them that globally almost half of child deaths that are in the neonatal period. Countries care about those targets, they care about the newborn deaths and that's what's driving their failure. In South Asia that's now 60% of the deaths are in the neonatal period. That's why it's on the agenda. Stillbirths, 2.6 million, most unacceptably 1.2 million, where the woman goes through a whole nine months of labour and that of, of, of pregnancy, and that baby dies during labour. Starts labour, alive, dies during labour. A failure of our system, a failure of our care, a lack of midwives, a lack of obstetric care. It's a, also a lack of accountability. So in global tracking, you only count if you come out alive. There are no mentions of the word stillbirth. There's no target. The data is weaker. Hannah Blenker, who's here, is working on the new estimates with WHO. We've tripled the number of data points, but it's still weak, especially for intrapartum stillbirths. The progress is slower, and that progress is slower not because there are things we can't do. There are things we can do. It's slower because we haven't paid attention to these issues. And so this leaves us at the end of the greatest success, perhaps, in global health, with child health and at some progress for, new, for maternal, still leaves us with nine million deaths, an unfinished agenda, leaves us with two-thirds of them around the time of birth, and leaves us with most of them still not really being accounted for in systems, born and dying without death or birth certificates. So that's a huge, a huge issue that we think everybody will care about. And we come to the SDGs, what are we going to have in the SDGs that's going to make us not just finish this agenda, but keep up the increased speed, reach the poorest, 
reach those post-conflict and conflict areas where the situation is worst. So as Richard said, eight MDGs. What he didn't say was who wrote them. So the MDGs were written by a few people in a room in New York, predominantly, around the turn of the millennium. Those few people were probably mostly white men. Certainly several of them were economists. And that explains the goals. There are eight goals, uh, poverty, hunger. There are three on health. So health is really at the heart of the MDGs. And why was that? It was because these economists believed, and their dialogue was, that wealth is dependent on health. And that for development, you have to invest in health at the heart. But what's happened when we come to the SDGs correctly is that it's a much bigger dialogue. The environment, economic development, what are we doing with human rights? Is this something where we look at process or outcome? Is it the economy versus social goods? And so whatever happens, we will not have the same dialogue that we could have. Where you could go into a country and people know they have a health goal, they know that that's critical, most donor funding is coming towards that and you can argue for things to be spent based on evidence in theory. This is going to be a much more complicated dialogue where we have to be smarter, make the economic case, make the environmental case. And so here we are with the latest edition of these goals, as Richard said, 60, 17. They're unlikely to change from these 17 now. There's still some discussion about the indicators. There's been consultation over the last few months. But if you look at this, the biggest win here are these ones in black, which is really about economics and infrastructure. So now, all around half of our targets are around economics and infrastructure. The next biggest win are these in green, the environment. We have one just for oceans. <laughs> the oceans have definitely come out stronger in this. We have some of these ones that very much still are very intimately linked to health, poverty, hunger, gender equality, water and sanitation, education. But the specific health goal is down to one out of 17. That one goal means that we have to work in a different way. We have to work as one. But within that, we have three, nine different thematic areas which are grouped. So this is under SDG 3. There are three that are considered to be the unfinished MDG. Three for the non-communicable diseases which were truly left out of the last framework. And then what's imaginatively called a mix. <laughs> there is an explicit, so not goal level, but target level sexual and reproductive health care services. So very clearly there. Universal health coverage here, which also is clearly fundamental to the things that we believe in and want to do. And directly linked to reproductive health, all these ones in red. But probably the ones that we're most directly involved in are the maternal mortality and the newborn part. So that's where I would like to go next, is what are those targets? What's proposed at the moment? What do we think about those? And are we doing the right things with those? And in preventable maternal deaths, so the follow-on to MDG5. So this is what's proposed at the moment. And the proposal is one global average target of 70 per 100,000, but with different targets for different countries. So how to achieve that? Those above a very high maternal mortality ratio at present would have a lower absolute target. There's a process around which expert teams, particularly from WHO, would work with countries to set their targets. Uh, but clearly, a lot of the world is already lower than 70. So what applies there? So I think it's critical that we have a, a goal. It's critical that our goal and target, this is, sorry, target, not goal, the target is ambitious enough too. Are we continuing the same level of ambition? So for those of you who are around when the MDGs were set, it was, they were laughed out of court in many places for being too ambitious. 
Andy Haynes wrote a paper around 2000 about how none of the MDGs could possibly ever be met. But it was partly the level of ambition that pushed change. And there's a balance between ambition and realism. And if we're not ambitious enough, we won't reach the change that is needed. What about for child deaths? So the follow-on and this target for child mortality was set by Promise Renewed initially for 2035, but now pulled back to 2030. The target for child is that every country should have a national under five mortality rate of 22 or less. The target for neonatal mortality was set through the Every Newborn Action Plan. Around 60 country direct consultations sign off at the World Health Assembly with all countries signing on that and a lot of dialogue. 11 different options for national targets that were discussed and considered. And this is what the final conclusion was, an NMR of 12 or less by 2030. So, is that good or is that bad? The MDGs had relative targets, meant everybody was on the hook. Two thirds reduction everywhere. Every country should meet it, every region should meet it, every, the world should meet it. If you have an absolute target, in fact, around 100 countries have already met this, more for the maternal one, probably about 120 countries. Uh, about 29 countries really have a heavy lift to get there. But that's what countries apparently said they wanted. They wanted everybody to have the same uh, level. But I, I think this still leaves questions. And if we sign off on this, what we have to do then is we, as a global community, have to be most responsible for the countries that need the heaviest lift. What about stillbirths? So during the consultation for the Every Newborn Action Plan, in multiple countries, countries and women told us they wanted stillbirths to have a target. Part of the reason stillbirths haven't made progress is because there wasn't a target. If there isn't a target, you don't collect data, you're not responsible for it. So that was a clear message that was heard. And a target was set to a national stillbirth rate of 12 or less by 2030 signed off at the World Health Assembly and part of the Every Newborn Action Plan. But as Richard said, it's not in the SDGs. Not only is it not in the SDGs, it's not even mentioned in any of the, even the additional indicator list. So when they had 100 indicators plus 100 additional ones, it wasn't even in the 100 additional. And if you look at the consultations in the last round, more than 30 organisations said it should be here. But if you look at a list of things that they can't address, stillbirths is in the middle of that list. If there's one thing that you can put your voice to that would make a difference and that only has a window probably of the next six weeks, it's that stillbirths should be mentioned. And we can say that in the child goal, it has child, infant and neonatal. Infant doesn't add anything for the decision maker. Could they please remove infant and add stillbirth, which is absolutely critical. And so what is critical for the next generation? So Richard has already said that one of the big shifts is that adolescents need to be at the heart. Girls and women are at the heart of development for the next generation, whether that's education, empowerment, equity, ec economic growth for them, and health. How do we operationalise that in health? So this shift from pitting a woman against her own baby against her child in global health funding can be totally changed by shifting to a life course. And in that life course, while everything matters, there are critical points. The most critical points are adolescence and that transition, risk and opportunity, birth, greatest risk point in your life, and what happens for children. Not only should they not die, they should develop well. And so, if we're able to shift to a life course where we're looking especially at what happens to adolescents, what happens to births, that they, reproductive health services are there so that they're planned and wanted, that care at birth is there and the healthy start and what happens to children. This would allow us to move to an integrated call. It allows us to be more intentional about integrated services. And for our audience here, we need to think about integrated research, whether that's epidemiology and a life course approach, whether that's epigenetics that's intergenerational, preterm birth, stunting, many of these things that are much more complex than just one moment shot. And how do we do that, especially in implementation? So what I want to focus on in the little bit of time that I have left is particularly on that birth moment. Why does it matter? 
the moment of greatest risk for the woman, risk where hours, even minutes count, and for the babies where minutes, even seconds count. I've mentioned the 1.2 million intrapartum stillbirths, more than one million babies dying on that birthday, highest risk for maternal deaths. It's also the critical moment for child development and disability. Preterm birth is now the leading cause of child deaths worldwide, not just in rich countries, but worldwide. And those 15 million preterm babies that are born every year are now starting to survive in middle-income countries, but we're not tracking disability. But in low-income countries, disability is not the main problem, but death is. And if we want to make the case for investing in care at birth, the deaths for women are critical and a human rights issue. But the big numbers, the big dallies, the big investment case will come from counting the babies, the disability outcome, and adding the stillbirths that aren't even here. And that's the best way for us to make the case for a return on investment. If we look at preconception care, pregnancy care, care at birth, and care particularly for babies after birth, the green is neonatal lives saved, the blue is stillbirth averted, and this is maternal lives saved. If we want to make the case, we need to include these deaths together, because there is no argument for cost effectiveness when they're included together. But where do we start with that? We've had this fantastic shift that even five years ago we couldn't imagine of births into facilities. But if we look at these births, this is a hospital I worked in in Ghana, this is a picture courtesy of Wendy. Well, we still have 50 million births at home not coming into facilities for many reasons, not least of which is the facilities really aren't a smart place to come sometimes. We also have a huge shift into overcrowded facilities where we aren't even providing the basic things. Indeed, in some of these, we are doing more harm than good. We have a moral responsibility because of the investments we have made to bring women into facilities to make sure those women and those babies get what they should get. And in the next five years, not the next 15, our community needs to act differently to make sure that this becomes a reality. That every mother, every newborn, every stillbirth that should have been averted in these facilities is averted. And this is something the UN is really taking leadership on. Kim Dixon is here, Matthews is here. And this is a new initiative to make this a rights-based approach for every woman and every baby. There's a lot more detail in the Every Newborn series and the Every Newborn Action Plan and, uh, and in the session this afternoon. But the basic principles are that we need to invest in this time, especially in midwives, that we need to improve quality, not just be there, but we need quality. That we need to look at equity, and that particularly in conflict areas where women and children are being left behind. We need to harness parents, they're not passive, including fathers. We need to count the newborns, the other outcomes, including stillbirths, and what happens for the woman. So what can we do? I want to finish with this, and this really builds on what Richard has said. There are five things that we need to do differently as a community. The first is we need to be much more intentional about leadership. And Richard talked about leadership of Ban Ki-moon and leadership of Harper and leadership of politicians. I want to talk about your leadership. You can really lead the change, but where we need that most is to invest in leadership in these high burden countries. You have many privileges in your training in academia here and in the colleges. What are we doing to make that accessible? The problem for women's and children's health globally is not particularly one of commodities. It's particularly one of people with leadership and skills. And we really need to change that. We need to be calling for integrated plans, not separate ones. We need to be making the investment, and Richard kindly said this is now linked to impact. I'm not sure it is. Most of the donor funding that has come in has been hugely weighted on vaccines and, and HIV. We really need long-term investment in things that count for women and children as well. We need to drive our innovation to link to implementation and change. 
And we particularly have neglected this area. For maternal and newborn health, we have neglected coverage data. Coverage data, not just for do you have a skilled birth attendant, are you in a facility, but what is happening? Are you getting oxytocin? Are you getting resuscitation? What drives the fact that Gavi can get more than the money they ask for is not just that they're clever at advocacy, it's because they measure things. They can tell you how many people got things. They can tell you who didn't. They can tell you where the fifth child is who isn't getting things. If we want to change women's and children's health, we need to change our data, and we need to be ambitious about changing that. I'm delighted to be working with Matthews on that for some of the newborn stuff, and we really are working to link that with the maternal, and we'd love to discuss that more. Finally, where to focus most? We tend to focus for global goals on these big burden areas. This is for neonatal mortality, but it would be the same for maternal deaths or stillbirths. India, Nigeria, and so on. That is important. And these ones that are light, in light blue, just since the Every Newborn Action Plan was launched last July, each of these countries now has a plan, and all but one of them is an integrated plan with their maternal newborn child health strategy. But what about these? The greatest equity gap, the highest risk. Many of these are conflict zones. Sierra Leone has the highest neonatal mortality rate in the world in 2013, pre-Ebola. We've been saying for a decade that neonatal mortality is a marker of your health system weakness. But babies don't make very much noise. Come along with Ebola and people spot that that is a health system weakness. And yet there are as many newborn deaths in one day as in the entire Ebola epidemic. So in the post-Ebola health system strengthening, things are worse now for women and for babies. How are we going to make that change? So finally, the face of the next generation is an African. At the moment, a quarter of our world's births are in Africa. By the time 2030 comes, at least a third will be, even with the most optimistic scenarios with increased family planning. This year, 50% of those are now in facilities. A third are still home alone. And home alone is the poorest. Hopefully, they may get some community care afterwards. Some will be born in facilities, many overcrowded, like the one I showed you before. This is one in Uganda, where they're actually starting to really improve quality of care. But some, even in the poorest countries in Africa, can access intensive care. It is up to us and what we do for the next generation to ensure that that dividing care is not determined by your income, but it's determined by your needs. Thank you. Thank you.